patients has, because these drugs all work the same way. Anybody have any questions? I'll hand it over to Dr. Madison. Hello, my name is Carla Madsen. I'm the director of the Molecular Genetics Lab at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Tennessee. I've uh, been doing that for about 30 years. And um, so my, my part of this little show is to talk about what's the practicality of talking to your oncologist and applying this in the laboratory. Um, and the first thing I will say is education, education, education. My oncologists are very slow to think about this, despite multiple grand rounds, etc. In the grand rounds, they're very responsive, but trying to get them to actually order it is something else. I think the first time somebody uses it and then the, the uh, insurance company says you didn't ask for permission first, uh, we'll probably change things. Also, the next first time there's a lawsuit, um, probably will also change it. So the current testing standard um, that's put out there is to perform KRASH, the 1213 uh, mutation, um, codon mutations at least, analysis before treatment of colon cancer with EGFR targeted antibody based treatments. The insurance companies require this. I mean, it's gone out there in big print. The questions I would bring up and, and the questions, questions that are in the literature are, should we include other KRAS mutations, particularly codon 61, which is fairly prevalent? Should we add on, as, as, Doc, as Mary said, uh, BRAF, um, either the V600E and perhaps others, added to the requirement? And finally, should the assay be done before any treatment is given? Right now, the recommendation is before EGFR targeted treatments, which can be two or three years down the line after diagnosis. The point I would put bring forward is, should we be doing this at the point of diagnosis so that you know what your options are going to be? There's also discussion in the literature about using the EGFR antibodies in a cocktail as first line treatment, um, so, sort of giving it two different hits so that it can't become resistant. So if that were the case, then you would want to have this done immediately. So I think part of the lag that we're seeing in the laboratories for this could be the fact that we're people are still in their first round of, of treatment and we're, the, the new people are not getting tested right immediately. They're waiting for two or three years. So hopefully things will change because I really think doing it at the time of diagnosis is the best clinically. It's obviously the best for the laboratories, but <laughs> um, clinically I think it will also be. So both the, besides KRAS, the BRAF and, and the PIK3CA mutations, that was the second um, pathway that Mary showed you. Um, are associated with decreased response to antibody therapy. There are multiple papers out there in the last two years that support this. The ends are small compared to the KRAS papers, but they're still very supportive. Um, BRAF V600E, which is the most prevalent BRAF mutation, is associated, uh, also been shown to be associated with dysregulation in vitro. So you not only have clinical data, you actually have looking at it um, biomet biometrically. Um, and in the case of the PIK3CA, there's some exon, I think it's nine and 20 mutations, and it looks like maybe the 20 mutations are the only ones, but it's not, that's not as clear. So those, those are still some things that are up in the air. But at least looking at these two things in, the, in, in addition to KRAS, I think is, su is supported in the literature. Doesn't have the uh, statements from on high yet, but these are the kinds of things that you have to talk to your physicians about because you want to know how far you should go. Um, some companies give you KRAS only assays, some com companies have the option to go farther. I'm t using this paper from 2009 as an example. There's many papers out there, but I like these numbers. So um, we know that if you treat uh, with the antibody based treatment um, all comers, you'll get a 30th percentile response. Um, the re and if you, we also know that about 40% of colon cancers are at least KRAS positive. So if we take that 40% out to start with, you've obviously got to get an increased re, uh, response. This paper is really nice because it, sits, it says we had 68 KRAS wild types. So we've already taken out the KRAS um, mutant ones out of this paper. Only 22 of those 68 responded. So it's, no, it's not a clear shot because there's other reasons why they won't respond to the antibody. But if you look at the 46 non-responders, 60% of those had mutations either in the 61 primarily or the, the V600E or the PIK3CA. So if you were to put those all together, your response rate would be much, much, much higher. 
So what I've done is I've taken that data and I put it into some flowcharts, and these work with the, physici with the physicians. So here we are, as it was six months ago or a year, 100 patients with colon cancer, antibody treatment. 30 to 40 of them would be sensitive. 60 to 70 of them would not be. If you do KRAS and BRAF and PIC3, or just KRAS and BRAF, I only did here, out of your original 100, you took out 40 who were KRAS positive, then you took out another 18 who were KRAS 61 and BRAF positive, that left you 42 to treat. You still get the 30. I took the bottom of it. You still get the 30, but now you have a 71% response rate to that treatment. That's what will sell this assay. That's what will sell the, the physicians in grounds rounds go, oh, that's really much better. I would much rather say that to my patient <laughs> than there's a 30% chance this is going to work. A 70% chance this is going to work is much better. And you have 12 that don't respond that have to go on. So this is the kind of thing that's necessary to sell this, and it really makes me say that you cannot just do KRAS 1213 because you're missing a whole bunch more. You really are. It's not practical anymore. It's even, even if it's not in the little boxes anywhere yet. What to do with those individuals who are KRAS positive and BRAF positive? Obviously, the classical available treatments are possible um, because the EGFR targeted treatments, either the antibodies or the, inhibit, the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors won't work. MEK, which is the one that's the protein that's downstream from RAF on that side, um, or ERK, which is the next one down, those targeted inhibitors will slow the growth, at least in vitro. <laughs> There's not a lot of clinical that I've found yet. BRAF is more sensitive to both of these, so it's perfect for if you have a BRAF mutation um, person. Um, so those are some options that are coming down the, the pike. Uh, so the recent recommendations that have come out from EGAPP, they support the use of BRAF. Um, they, they support the use of genetic testing for tumors for BRAF in patients with colon cancer that are MSI high to identify those that would be not likely to have MLH1 mutations. So it's a, something to, to, to put into the other aspect of it, which is can we identify subsets of colon cancer based on their mutations? And so using BRAF as a, um, as a, as a screen for MLH1 mutations is, is a possibility. It's actually in their recommendations. Positive BRAF V600E is unlikely to be mutant at MLH1. So there's another bit of information that for those physicians who are into that now, and they're beginning to get there. Again, this is sort of cutting edge for a lot of the general physician oncologists. I'd like to talk a little bit about some other tum tumor types, because I think there's a big application that you can sell to your physicians to make this a, a higher volume test for your laboratories. And I'm talking from the practical side here. I'm not talking about whether the oncologists agree with me. I'm talking practicalities here. Papillary type thyroid, Somewhere, maybe 30% of them um, are BRAF positive, BRAF V600E. So BRAF testing can theoretically, can theoretically increase your, your, your di sensitivity for diagnosis in thyroid cancers. More frequent in ultrasound positive nodules. If you find that you have a papillary thyroid carcinoma that's BRAF positive, it, it is more aggressive. If you do needle biopsy before sh surgery and know that you, the BRAF sta status from that, from that surgery biopsy, you, you know that your patient's already set up for a poor outcome and increased risk of metastasis, risk of metastasis or recurrence, so you can uh, be more aggressive in your, in your thyroidectomy um, with that knowledge. Um, doing some work on this to whether or not we can do that with the fine needle aspirates is a little bit of a rough job, but I'm working with Patrick on that uh, right now. Um, treatment then, if you had a BRAF positive um, thyroid cancer, the MEK inhibitors that we talked about because they're more, more effective with the BRAF mutation. So that might be something, again, they're all experimental right now, but certainly they're coming. Um, interestingly, Solendac, which is a non-steroidal, uh, decreases cell proliferation in, in BRAF positive cells. So uh, that could be some of the uh, reason why we hear comments about uh, Solendac being um, helpful in treatment of, of keeping down colon cancer because it keeps the polyps from, from exploding. <clears throat> another one, another tissue that we could think about with, with this testing is melanoma. Again, 30 to 45 percent of melanomas are BRAF positive. They're present in the non-cancerous nevi, sort of like KRAS is in the, in the polyps for colon cancer. They're present in the 
KRAS mutations are present in the polyps, the early polyps that haven't yet become, become cancerous. Um, so it's a hyperplasia marker. Um, if you add P10 silencing to, um, to a BRAF mutation in, mans in, in mice, you get cancer. So what we're looking at is probably the double hit, except two different pathways rather than a single pathway double hit. Again, BRAF mutations are sensitive to MEK, so we might see that where MEK, and we're already seeing that in the literature, MEK treatments of melanoma is effective, at least for short term. <clears throat> Interestingly, another one to think about is ovarian. Um, in about 10 to 20 percent of ovarian carcinoma cell lines, they have one or the other mutation, more frequent than the lower grade non-serous types. Perhaps you would target with MEK inhibitors then to treat ovarian cancer. Um, and this just came out last week. Um, it's not one of the ones that's on the panel of anybody right now, so I don't know what the, what the status is. But there's a mutation in the three prime end of the KRAS gene that's a LET7 microRNA binding site. Um, and it seems to be hereditary, so in non-BRCA1 and BRCA2 hereditary cancer families, 61% in their small study, and wasn't great, 61% um, of them carried a, a, a germline KRAS mutation. Uh, so obviously here's something else where KRAS is going to be moving forward. So what we're seeing, what we're seeing in the laboratory is, is that if you can get them to bite on colon cancer, um, and on the thought that there's going to be more and more information that these are going to give you as time goes on, then your volume will go up. I'll be real frank with you. I come from a small lab from a major medical center in Knoxville, Tennessee, so it's not exactly Harvard. Um, and getting the oncologist to bite has been hard, um, very hard. Uh, but once I get one and give them a positive, then they come back, then they come back. But you have to get the first positive. It's like my first HFE was on a gastroenterologist guy. So he didn't have to have his liver cancer, his liver biopsy done. So he was happy with HFE. So that's the bit, is to try to get your first positive and then they come back. Uh, the pathologist, we work with our pathology department because it has you have to have the pathologist or either external pathologist or an internal pathologist mark your slides as to where the cancer cells are and then you scrape your slides to prep the DNA. So you have to work closely with your pathologist, and our pathologist in our, our center work very well with us. It's just getting the oncologists on board. Thank you. Okay, so 